It's Ports of Call Waterfront Dining, award-winning service and cuisine with a view of the dynamic L.A. Harbor from every seat. For reservations and directions, visit portsofcalldining.com or call 310-833-3553. Miles Davis, Steve Martin, Frank Zappa, Elvis Costello, Thelonious Monk, and George Carlin are among the many people credited with a quote, Writing about music is like dancing about architecture. Whoever said it, the meaning is the same. Writing about music is a waste of time and doesn't mean shit. Well, the first thing that must be said in response is that without architects, no dance halls could be built, and where will we dance? More fundamentally, I am reminded of the words of Jackson Brown, who said, Once I put out a song, it no longer belongs to me. It belongs to you to take it in and give it your own meaning. That's what music writers do, give it their own meaning. Since they have a platform, they, like musicians, reach other people. And whether readers agree with what they write or not, it's all part of a quest to find meaning in life. Check out what one of the greatest music writers, James Baldwin, wrote in his book, Just Above My Head. Music don't begin like a song. Forget all that bullshit you hear. Music can get to be a song, but it starts with a cry. That's all. It might be the cry of a newborn baby, or the sound of a hog being slaughtered, or a man when they put a knife to his balls. And that sound is everywhere. People spend their whole lives trying to drown out that sound. Welcome to Episode 6 of Love and War, the podcast in which the irresistible force overcomes the immovable object. I'm your host, Lee Ballinger. I'm an author, poet, and producer based in Los Angeles. If you want to know more, check out my bio on Facebook, L-E-E-B-A-L-L-I-N-G-E-R. You can hit me up at rockrap at AOL.com, R-O-C-K-R-A-P, or on Facebook. The Dixie Chicks are finally back on tour again, filling arenas from coast to coast. In 2003, they were touring Europe, and during a show in London, Natalie Maines of the Chicks said, Just so you know, we're on the good side with y'all. We do not want this war, this violence. And we're ashamed that the President of the United States is from Texas. This brief comment created a firestorm of controversy back in the USA. This is what I wrote about it at the time for Rock and Rap Confidential, which I share now because it remains relevant today. Last, last year, Natalie Maines of the Dixie Chicks contemptuously dismissed Toby Keith's popular pro-war song, Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue saying it was ignorant, and it makes country music sound ignorant. No boycott was called. In fact, not a word was said. So there's no reason to interpret the hostile response that followed Maine's anti-war comments as the spontaneous reaction of an outraged country audience. In fact, the attack on the Dixie Chicks was a political maneuver no less calculated than the Watergate break-in. According to a story from AmericanNewsreel.com sent to RC by former Reprise Records President Howie Klein, quote, phone calls originating from a Republican Party headquarters in Washington went out to country stations, urging them to remove the chicks from their playlist. The alternative concert to the Dixie Chicks tour opener is actually the work of the South Carolina Republican Party. We received a call urging us to support the alternative concert. Caller ID backtraced the call to South Carolina GOP headquarters. End quote. Chain radio stations were quick to dump the chicks because their parent companies have pressing business in the nation's capital 
and they need help from the Republican Party. The Dixie Chicks Top of the World Tour was set to begin in Greenville, South Carolina on May 1st. The state legislature had passed a resolution condemning the group. Lipton T, their corporate tour sponsor, scrapped most of its endorsement deal with the Chicks, saying that it's wrong to be for peace. In the wake of the many death threats against the three young women in the group, bomb dogs searched the Bilo Center in Greenville before the show. Lon Helton, country music editor of Radio and Records, claimed that country fans are all right-wing, saying, Country music is for people who live in between the Hudson and the Hollywood sign, and they have a different view. If all country fans opposed Natalie Maine's plea for peace, that raised the question, would anyone show up at the Dixie Chicks shows? Would the group back away from its beliefs in a desperate attempt to save its career? At the concert in Greenville, there were only a few empty seats, and the crowd was doing the wave even before the show began. After the third song, Natalie Maines, clad in a tank top and blazing with Dare to be Free, offered the crowd a chance to boo. If there were any boos, they couldn't be heard over the huge applause, reported the Greenville News. Not a discouraging word could be heard when a video was shown on stage that highlighted the civil rights movement, Gandhi, Malcolm X, and women's rights, along with footage of people stomping on records by the Beatles, Sinead O'Connor, and the Dixie Chicks. The Chicks got the same enthusiastic response everywhere they went on the first southern leg of their tour. Sometimes there would be one protester standing outside with a pro-Bush sign, sometimes none. The reception given the Dixie Chicks below the Mason-Dixon line doesn't change the reality that there is a powerful and dangerous streak of jingoism in America, one that has its strongest roots in the South. But the Dixie Chicks have proven that there are two sides to that story, even more than their music and their courage. That may turn out to be their greatest gift of all. Decades ago, I was at Madison Square Garden in New York City with my son to see a hip-hop show featuring Dougie Fresh and Curtis Blow. It was a great night, which ended with Curtis and other performers playing basketball on stage. It certainly never occurred to me during that show that someday I might share a stage with Curtis Blow. But that's just what happened recently. The stage was the parking lot of Faith Lutheran Church in Inglewood, California. The occasion was a Stop the Violence Cultural Festival, co-sponsored by Hip Hop Church LA, a ministry co-founded by Curtis Blow in 2005, and House of the Common Thread, a growing network of Los Angeles street ministers. Curtis Blow was there to preach and to rap, and I was there to give support and to do a poem. The slogan of the day was, Southern California Ceasefire, Let Me Live. The reality of the situation was brought home when a young man who was at the event to do some live painting, the brother of one of my best friends, got a call before he could start to fill his canvas that a friend of his had just been shot and killed. The festival immediately stopped to ceremoniously surround our painter with love and respect. It was a painful, beautiful moment but we've got to do more than that. We have to come together and work out a realistic plan to actually stop the violence. I have a new book out called Love and War, my first 30 years of writing. You can download a copy absolutely free at loveandwarbook.com. That's loveandwarbook.com. Let me know what you think of it. The old man walked haltingly into the bar. He moved as though he had a cane, although he didn't, so you might say he walked like a man who had lost his cane. As his eyes adjusted to the dim light, he noticed a young man with a cast on his arm who was drinking at the end of the bar. The old man shambled over next to him. I saw your performance last night, he said. I know what your favorite album is. Huh? The young man stammered. 
Talking Heads, more songs about buildings and food. Damn, you're right. The old man pointed at the cast on the young man's arm. When you get that cast off, make sure you do your rehab, all of it. Otherwise, you'll end up like me. The old man finished his drink and began to move toward the jukebox. He walked haltingly, as if he had a cane, but he didn't, so you might say he walked like a man who had lost his cane. Do I speak for the world? Let's finish up with a quote of the week. This one from Nashville music writer Holly Gleason, who said, There will always be a how it is, and if that's all you choose to see, that's all there ever will be. But to look at where you are, what is happening, to consider why, you can begin to dream beyond the moment, envision how it can be more, brighter, greater. That's it for now. If you see me on the street, smile back. Bop.